Hi guys and welcome to another episode of JDM Masters Car Reviews and today we are back in Hakone and this time it's a beautiful summer day on the Lake Ashi as you can see here and today we have the Lancer Evolution 10 and we're going to be talking about this car so come and join us. So this is our third Lancer Evolution review and we have reviewed two more in our previous videos the Lancer Evolution 1 and the Evolution 5 which you can see up above here and we decided well we did one we jumped five to five and why not jump another five directly to the ten so there's a reason for previewing the last Lancer Evolution uh, in our car review because we feel that this could be the very best Lancer Evolution of all now it isn't really a true JDM car anymore from the Lancer Evolution 8 and the 9 which was exported to various markets especially in North America the Evo 10 was a world car finally um, no longer that uh, Japanese manufacturers like the Mitsubishi kept their prized four-wheel drive monsters um, like you can see all this historic book here all these different models they weren't available from one until six in various various most of the world market but the 10 was a true world car and why not because it has very outstanding performance uh, in a four-door package it had rally heritage and all that technology that Mitsubishi had gathered from years of WRC and passed down through generations have a look at this history book right here this was made on the second edition of the Evolution 10. You have here the 9, all these memorable cars, 10 here. And going back, um, let's go through the step. Evolution 1, 2, and 3. The yellow one, very iconic. And then the second generation 4, which is here. Which is here, this is the Lancer Evolution 4. The 5, looking exactly like the one we reviewed before. And then come to the six with the rally. And this was the last of the Group A WRCs. Then going into the Evolution Seven, of course. Before that, you had the very valuable Tommy Mackin, and especially in this color, uh, the most valuable Evo right now in the market. But then going into the CT9A, the seven, the had a GTA Seven, which is a very interesting automatic only model. The eight. And the 8MR, which is a special edition model, the 9, the 9MR, there's a lot of them, and also a very rare wagon, finally ending in this. Now, the Lancer Evolution 10 was produced from 2007 until 2016 in Japan. They had the final edition. So, unlike the previous editions, where one model was released almost one every year in order to keep up with the WRC, regulations in order to enter it uh, into competition which Mitsubishi didn't really need to do after the 7 because it became a WRC car. Now the 10, while it didn't enjoy the rally um, racing heritage of like the previous models but it enjoyed a lot more things that, that their forebearers carried in terms of technology that came into this car. So we're going to have a look at it. Lake Ashi stands on top of the Hakone Mountain Onsen Hot Spring Range and the lake is a volcanic lake made from volcanic activity around the area. It's not too far from the Mount Fuji area, uh, which you can't see today because it's really cloudy usually in summer. But there you have a motorized tour pirate boat uh, that goes up and down the lake. And of course, it's very cool 
up here compared to being down on the ground and it's the, also hosts the perfect setting for test sports cars like this. There's lots of different mountain routes called toge which uh, we ourselves enjoy quite a lot driving around and testing these cars and since the Evolution 10 is a rally car um, obviously this is the best place to test it. So let's have a look now at the base design. So when we study any high performance model of a normal model, it's always good to look at the base model because this is what the foundations are good on. If the base model isn't good enough to build a high performance sports car, then it's no use. This goes the same for cars like the Skyline GTR, uh, the Honda Type R series, the Impreza STI, and of course, no lesser the Lancer Evolution. Based on the normal, well, it's a little bit strange. Perhaps uh, those of you outside Japan will know the base model as a Lancer, but in Japan, it was called a Galant Fortis. Now, they do always have different names in the JDM market, but the Galant was phased out after the 1996-2005 uh, model and there was a little gap in the segment and so because this next generation Lancer grew quite considerably in size they decided to include the Galant name but for the Evolution model they kept it as a Lancer so you'll find Galant Fortis Rally Arts running around in Japan instead of Lancer Rally Arts. A little bit of confusion there clears up the JDM market naming thing but this is very much a Lancer Evolution. Bigger in size by length and also width. But the most important thing about the new model was the body rigidity. So we're going to check out how different the basic body shell of the Galant Fortis uh, Lancer from 2005 is from the previous CDA base for the CT9A. And let's have a look here. New materials, higher tensile strength with higher um, MPA used in the basic body shell and of course reinforced uh, strategically especially for the Lancer Evolution as you can see here typical things like uh, the aluminium crush bar in front now this is not only for body rigidity but also for uh, impact these are made of aluminium and lots of various strengthening bars and braces inside but already the Galant Fortis original basic body shell used on the breaded butter models was supposedly already stronger than the Lancer Evolution 9. Now body rigidity is of course very important to make any sports car handle well but it's also for crash safety. Now the Mitsubishi technology um, is a little bit different from other top makers like Honda or Toyota because Mitsubishi is actually a huge company that owns heavy industries, electronics, and just about they own, they own everything in Japan from banking into real estate. So that conglomerate can tap on every single resource to get the highest technology available. And they do put it into their cars. The body shell uh, uses very good metal, not to say that it isn't used by other companies, but Mitsubishi have a different way of doing things. Uh, a lot of their cars are built very much like tanks, um, taking also from the military history. And they seem to put it into this sturdy, more squarish, but modern shape of, of, the, of the Lancer Evolution 10. So of course, being a rally car with 300 over horsepower and 40 kilograms of torque with four wheel drive, high grip tires, um, they really needed to make their last car um, as handle as sharply as possible as they could. And let's have a closer look inside this magazine here. And one of the most important things in a saloon body is to have this V-brace. Uh, it's not exclusively used, of course, by Mitsubishi, but uh, if we could just peer inside, um, it's quite evident that the rigidity in the local area stiffness as well is quite a different level uh, from the previous generation, at least. Uh, at least when driving it, it feels extremely stiff. Now, a little word about body rigidity. If you look at manufacturers, they will always sometimes quote uh, how many percent stiffer it is over the previous models. They might even give, you know, like big numbers in Newton degrees, um, in bending or torsional rigidity. But of course, those figures are important, but it doesn't really translate into the feeling of body rigidity that transfers to driver. And this is where the Lancer Evolution 10 also maybe cars like the R35 GTR um, in the post 2005 era makes it feel quite different from the 90s cars. Now there's also another thing to remember while these bodies are also much stiffer it had to 
be stiffer to handle the extra weight compared to the CT9A. It's almost 150 kilograms heavier than the previous car. So you'll think, well, you know, it's bigger. It shouldn't handle as well. But that's where you're completely wrong. You can take this on any mountain roads, on the circuit, and it will do exactly what you want. The new body shell of the Galant Fortis features newer technology in seam welding, uh, laser welding, and also making uh, different press lines and new techniques that keeps the body weight to a minimum. Of course, the body size was increased, but for that body size, they also managed to lower the weight a lot. By this time, even things like adhesives, glue, was used uh, to seal the, the different panels to make a, a strong, sturdy monocoque chassis. Now, Mitsubishi has kind of known to kind of go a little bit overboard with torsional rigidity, therefore making the cars heavier. But there was a purpose. It had to, to withstand the rigors of rally racing. While the Mid Evolution 10 never got the glory of racing in the World Rally Championship, there was also an RS version which amateurs would race in Group N and still being raced today uh, in Europe and even in, in Japan. The Evolution 10 is quite different from the base model Galant Fortis or the Lancer Rally Art. So it's not going to be that easy to convert your base models into the Lancer Evolution 10. Why? Let's have a look here. Now compared to the base model, here are the differences it's shorter on the front overhang by minus 45 on the front minus 45 on the rear wheelbase has grown by plus 15 as you can see here the front has been moved apart um, the front bumper and the rear is completely different and of course the lower suspension gives it minus 75 in height and of course looking here at the basic body shell like the previous Lancer Evolution uh, 7 8 and 9 flared bodywork on the rear fenders is molded into the actual body itself so you can see here how the lines gently come up and increase into the rear fender lines and it's more pronounced around the hip area um, obviously you can also see it from the uh, fuel cap and then going towards the front you know the evolution 10 and the base model has taken a more straight line approach the roof line is much more of like a coupe canopy than the previous model. This is where the aerodynamics really come into play. Photos of the design process uh, from the clay modeling right on top here and you're moving down you can see um, the different mock-up models and on the right side over here the all-important aerodynamic flow. So cars are always getting a bit more rounder and rounder uh, in order to create less drag and it's very evident by looking at this generation of model that the windshield is a little bit more uh, decreased in steepness in the angle joined up to the roof now the previous model already was a little bit round but this creates a very smooth line coming from the windscreen curved onto the roof which is aluminium up here by the way uh, which is why you can see these creases bumps on the top here um, to give it that extra strength at the mounting points. And then coming down towards the rear, it's another smooth slope with the edge of the roof joining smoothly into the top of the rear windscreen, coming down onto a very short rear overhang, which means that in order to achieve the same downfalls as the previous model, the rear wing could actually be smaller and therefore a little bit lighter. Um, looking at the middle here, uh, you have this bump that goes up on the top to create a bit more middle part downforce. Now what is also interesting is that you can see parts compared to the previous car which had carbon fiber the center part but this is just all plastic so it will cost down there but it doesn't mean it's less of you know in a higher performance. They spent the money on other parts of the car. Going down to the rear very stubby but also it's very more purposeful uh, the lights are long in shape, they kind of like taper towards the middle, but it kind of has the same feel as the front. It's a little more angular. Now, if you compare to reference photos of cars in 2007, the Impreza GRB hatchback and the Civic FD2 uh, in the last video, and Corolla or the Camry or even the GTR, the Evo 10 really stood out as something of a very sharp kind of design both in the front and the rear. It was kind of futuristic almost. 
but then we feel that the design of this hasn't actually aged that much. It's still relevant today uh, in many, many terms. You can see the Evolution 10 has a different lower part of the bumper. These are actually meant to be a sort of like a half diffusers. And these actually work. Um, it's positioned on the far side of the bumper. It works by channeling air coming from the inside of the wheels. The last part here is right in the middle, which is really, really interesting. Usually diffusers are situated in the middle. So you know, this part is kind of like right in the center of the wheel. This blank here is supposed to be for the stock muffler, which you can see in photos. Um, Julian's car has a different straight through, not really a straight through, but here, okay. Okay, this is a good photo. Now, actually this hole is meant to hold the exhaust mufflers of the stock, which are double, and the muffler is placed longitudinally rather than sideways. So there's no space to actually put a diffuser, but at least you could put a diffuser now probably. That is really big. It's titanium, by the way. Now this particular car is not stock. The wheels are not stock, obviously. Uh, they're Advan Racing RS. The stock tires are increased from a 245 to a 255, 35, and now 18 inch, which I think makes the car look a bit more, has given it a bit more purpose. Now the 245 on a big body like this was a little bit, hmm, not, a, not enough, you know? So uh, very nice tuning here. Um, he has HKS uh, Hypermax 4, enough to go on bumpy toges and also a little bit of track duty. The original car was specced with the high performance package, which had the Bilstein suspension. Um, Bilstein suspension was <laughs> a little bit more sporty, but was actually less stiff than the stock Evolution 10 ones. Um, the stock was really bouncy, really stiff. Um, I drove one myself and this HK suspension is a lot more stiff than that. I kind of like the Bielstein ones um, quite a lot more for like a daily drive. Front, it has increased Brembo discs with the same four port calipers, but the design is, is a bit different. Um, the high performance package also included the rare two piece rotor. This is just for the front. Two piece rotors were good because you could just change out uh, the rotors instead of the whole hub, but it also separates the hub from the disc. So, uh, you'll get less vibrations uh, when there's uneven heat given by hard braking. So racing cars usually have the two-piece rotor. And you can see how the more aggressive front fenders, um, the line, if you look carefully from the side here, bulges out a lot. And this is the biggest difference between the Rally Art model or the standard Galan Fortis model. Now, a little thing to note, the bonnet is aluminium, so are the fenders and the roof and the reinforcement front crash bar here. Uh, those were some attempts to reduce the weight of already quite heavy car. Uh, but Galan Fortis Rally Art also has these same vents and the NACA duct, which is right in the center. So why is it different from the previous model? Remember the previous model all the way from one had huge vents um, right in the front here and NACA duct on the side. This is completely different. But this is where I feel the Lancer Evolution 10 um, at launch, it had this special red premium color, and this is the original advertisement. Also looks really great in silver, but there's something that Mitsubishi designers really saw into the future when they designed this car back in 2006 and released in 2007. Um, the sharp lights with the front part of the grill um, protruding out, making and creating a kind of nose design, but bumper is separated by this huge grill here which for the Lancer Evolution models, of course, um, trying to get as much air into the intercooler uh, through the grills here, and also these huge slats right in the center uh, that goes into the radiator and top here. But you can see this design motive in a lot of cars from 2010 until today. And somehow the Evo 10 still managed to look relevant. I would say that even the current Impreza STI VAB kind of looks like the Evo 10. Uh, after 10 years. After 10 years, it still looks the same, you know. Uh, if you had updated it a little bit more, it would still stand, you know, head to head with modern cars. It's really not a problem. 
at all. Design-wise, uh, because there's no other base model after this one, uh, even in China, I think, where the base model still continued with a different exterior design, uh, the car hasn't really grown. I mean, you know, it, you won't have this impression of something that's outdated if there never was a next model. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's have a look at why the Evo 10 is completely different and probably a lot better than the previous models. It's all in the engine. I'm pretty sure this is an aluminum body. I'm going to prove it by lifting it with one finger as I have it most of the Okay, one finger is a bit too. Let me try two. All right, did it. <laughs> now, of course, it's not carbon fiber, but aluminum. Uh, reduces the weight compared to the steel bonnet by as much as 35 to 40 percent. So this is how a completely 100 percent stock Evo 10 engine should look like. This is a plastic cover that covers the engine, but on Julian's car uh, it's been removed so that we can see the engine in all its glory, what's hidden underneath. The engine is called a 4B11. Now very different from the legendary 4G63. I'm gonna look at why. So here's a diagram of the 4B11 MyVec. And the biggest difference is that it's lighter. In fact, it's 12.5 kilograms lighter than the 4G63, despite it being a two liter four cylinder engine. Now, how did they do that? That's huge. That's a huge difference. The 4G63 was an iron block. And so for the 4B11, um, they changed to an aluminum block, which is, you know, a lot of makers like Honda uh, and, and Toyota were already using aluminum blocks, uh, even back from the 90s, because those were NA engines. So the old thinking was that if you had an iron block, turbocharge it, it would create a lot of strength. So there was a lot of concern back in 2007 when the 4B11 was released as an aluminum block. People were questioning, was it, would it be strong enough to hold boost? Um, you know, how would it stand up against the legendary uh, 4G63 with the iron block and the, and the you know, fully cast sleeves and everything? Here is a diagram of the engine block itself and you can see here, uh, it's a semi-closed deck with very thick cylinder liners and a lot more improved porting for the cooling. Um, the all-important crankshaft is a lot more balanced and interestingly, the cylinder head is also lighter by about four kilograms uh, because it's simpler. Now, instead of relying on their own strong pistons, uh, which interestingly, from Evo 1 to 9, every generation had completely different pistons, which means there was always something to improve. So apparently Mitsubishi gave up, and this time for the 10, they used Mala uh, made pistons, which is a well-known um, manufacturer for uh, racing engines as well. Um, that's not the only piece. Uh, there are several other pieces which, which is also important in this design, and we're gonna talk about it. Let's look at the specs. So here are the biggest differences. 4G63 over here, bore 85, stroke 88, with the border stroke ratio at 1.04, which means it's a slightly a long stroke. The 4B11 is 86 times 86, making it a square engine. Long stroke engines have the advantage of having a bit more low end torque, uh, but not so much in high-end revability. Short-stroke engines like um, the 4G, 4AGE, the B16, crash. Ooh, okay, never mind. <laughs> um, have higher revability. Oh, don't forget the EG20. It's also a short-stroke engine. You can rev very high. RB26 too, but lacks in low-end torque. Now, that's not the Mitsubishi way. They had to have a good balance of low-end torque and power. So the answer was an 86 times 86. Now, Interestingly, there are other JDM engines which are also exactly 8686. K20A, SR20, 4G63, any more? FA20, not forgetting you Subaru and 86 guys That's out it. there. So what is this particular arrangement of 8686? Well, it just makes it easier to fit into two liters, but it also meant that the 4B level was much more flexible this time in terms of delivering power. Now, also the big change was the drivetrain here we go. The drivetrain included MyVec, which is actually a variable valve timing phasing, both on the intake and the exhaust. This is very similar to the W, the WBM. <laughs> BMW Double Venos and the very famous 
Altezza 3SGE Beams Dual VVTi. Exactly the same thing, okay? <laughs> um, but what is this mechanism so good for? It changes the timing of the camshaft and duration opening. And you can see here, it creating more overlap and adjusting it in degrees. Now, what this means is that it can make more fuel go in and mixture going into the uh, cylinder at lower engine speeds, which is usually where uh, it suffers. The so cam timing uh, is usually suited for a range between low RPM and high RPM. If you make power for high RPM, it usually suffers at the lower RPM, which is why Honda created VTEC. Now, with other car manufacturers, especially with the turbo, the answer was to use VVTi. Both on the intake and the exhaust, that really helped to change the power characteristics of this engine. So, let's look at the stock specs. 280 horsepower for the JDM version for the first edition, which is Julian's one. In reality, it had about 300. So for the next upgrade model, they actually said, yeah, it's 300, you know, we'll tell the truth. The American versions actually already had close to 300, but it's not all about power. In a turbocharged engine, what you want is torque, that, you know, very, very important twisting force to get you off the line. For the 9MR, it had 400, Newton meters for the same two liters for the Evo 10, 422 Newton meters stock. This was more than enough uh, to get the acceleration uh, within that five seconds that Evo always already had. With additional modifications to this engine, uh, it could achieve a lot more. Oh, one more thing to note about the aluminium engine of the 4B11 uh, compared to the 4G63, as you can see here. It is lower by 10 millimeters, so it gives it lower center of gravity. Now, how they've done this is really simple. They've turned the engine 180 degrees around, so the turbocharger is now facing the back and the intake is in the front, uh, which is a good thing. Um, a lot of modern engines past 2000s, like the K20A and um, Toyota's 2ZZ GE series, uh, already have this sort of arrangement, but it also meant that the turbocharger layout was a bit more complicated. Now, this intercooler piping goes all the way to the front, making quite a long route. Now, on the stock engine, this creates a bit of a problem, as we've discussed. In place of this very nice aluminium sturdy pipe here, the original one is a soft, almost aircon pipe hose rigidity, um, literally um, at full boost. The pipe is so soft that it would just, just, just suck and crush itself, you know. Um, and that was one of the weak points of the original design, uh, which we'll discuss later. So we have here Julian, who is the owner of the car, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the modifications done on your Evo 10. So I see you've removed the cover, but we can see the engine more clearly now. What's so, what's so particular about removing the cover, mate? I don't know, it's just a question of cooling, I guess. I don't like that big chunk of plastic in the middle who, you know... It's to save weight. <laughs> <laughs> make, make it safe, make it... So you don't need a, a carbon fiber hood, right? You just remove the plastic cover. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but this is really interesting. Yes, that the carbon box I was talking uh, later. So it was actually easier to buy that carbon box because I have the HKS uh, intake that replaced the stock system. Right, so, so that's a suction pipe system, right? Yes, yes. So if I wanted to retrofit the stock system, I had to change the whole intake because the diameter is different. So that was a bit troublesome. So I just get that cover, get the apexy filter. And so, yes, I could keep uh, the intake. Now also it has the um, stiffer aluminium piping that is a complete system goes, goes into yeah. the intercooler. Intercooler is stock way. though. Yes, yes. Actually, if you do some research, it seems that it's really high quality, better than the previous model. Mm -hmm. They improve the quality a lot on the radiator too. And uh, that's why a lot of people actually, yeah, if you just light in your car, you don't need to upgrade the, the intercooler and the radiator because it's already high quality. Having said that, the intercooler for all of the Lancer evolutions, even since one, is pretty big for a road car. Exactly. 
So it has this capability. Of course, the reason they did that was to homologate it for WRC. Yes, that's correct. But it's interesting that the same capacity intercooler can actually hold more boost and more power just as it is, especially the Evo 10. It's not need to upgrade at all. Yes, I don't know why yeah, the Evo 10, they, they really spend a lot of money on parts. Like, it seems to be higher quality than the previous mm -hmm. one. So it was obvious, very obvious that Mitsubishi spent a lot of money um, on the parts for the drivetrain and the engine rather than carbon fiber, rear wings, yes. and, you know, aluminium um, rear control arms, uh, which was a little bit of a strange disappointment. Yes. A little note for uh, people who want to modify their cars. There's a lot of different air filters in the market, yes. like uh, maybe overseas people use like K&N, which, which is actually the best? <laughs> That's the, <laughs> the question a lot of people are arguing over the internet, but the thing I can tell about the foam filter is usually degrades faster mm -hmm. than the paper filter. And so you get that old small dust from the, the foam. Especially when it gets old. Actually, yes, mm. getting inside. Uh, your engine which is obviously not mm. good and if you're making high boost also I've I've seen I mean I've heard and my tuner was telling me that basically the whole uh, foam just collapse and get sucked inside and blow the turbos oh my goodness I had this issue with my evolution 5 it had a foam type filter it was really old I didn't notice it and bits of it actually started breaking off yes that's and it hit the hot wire mm. of the airflow meter and oh. my, my car started start stuttering so paper is still the best way to go. Yes, yes. It doesn't degrade as fast and uh, it's much safer. And mm. it, depending on the brand, it's also, it has uh, better uh, filtering properties mm -hmm. compared to those foam filters. Right. So it's a win-win situation. That is also the reason why uh, OEM filters are made of paper. So uh, aftermarket ones are designed to give you a little bit more flow. So the shape of the cone filter, as we can say, um, supports higher boost. What is the ECU on this? The ECU is a monster ECU, which, uh, here. yes, like I said previously, increases uh, basically everything, the power, the boost, mm -hmm. but the response, especially on the top end, is, mm -hmm. is much, much better than the stock ECU. Right, right. Another modification I can see is a oil catch tank. So that's the cheap parts I got from Yahoo Auction. I just modified it to make it a little bit more efficient. And uh, usually when you have a turbo car, yeah, it's better to have one uh, because of the blow-by. Yeah. More, I mean, yeah, depending on the engine too, some engine are more prone to have some blow-by. That engine seems to be, as you can see, it's still very, uh, I mean, it works, I tested, and it's not that dirty. So yeah, there is not so much blow-by on that engine. The engine is basically only 40,000 kilometers, so mm. it's very healthy. Yeah, too. but the uh, oil catch tank is also important to keep the air intake stream clean. Yes. Yeah, free of uh, oil. And they do this for emissions purposes. Uh, so for tuned cars like yours, um, fitting this is a very important thing um, that should be part as a package uh, when you do tuning. So it's like not buy one part and fit it, but you should you know, get a minimum of parts in order to ensure reliability as well. Yes. Okay. So, oh, I see something nice and shiny over there. I think it is. This is the original catalog. Now this is really JDM. I'm not sure if you guys can get it overseas, but this is the accessories catalog for the Lancer Evolution 10 in Japan. And the strut bar uh, in front, red like this, that's very rare now. Yes. It's really, really rare. Very nice. It has the, the word over there. And um, here is the optional parts for the intake pipe. But as you can see, it's only these bits. The center part is still using the rubber one. Oh, you also have the rear strut bar, which is this one. Yes. Um, actually, the rear of the Lanza Evolution's body is really strong. Uh, the, the whole subframe uh, part of the, the firewall forms a kind of like already kind of strut, but that additionally creates even more rigidity. Not that it needs a lot more, but wow. Let's have a look at that. Part of the interesting design of the Lancer Evolution 10, like a lot of modern cars, because of the short rear overhang, the boot opening, and we can see here 
Um, it's on gas struts, which is a very interesting lever mechanism to sort of make the boot lid go um, at the same level. But it's very small, and compared to the Galant Fortis, it's a lot shallower. Why? Because as you can see, there is the battery compartment and the window washer. The window washer is behind. Yes, it's quite big. It's huge. See. Already they had this from the Lancer Evolution 6, which means the intercooler water spray is in front. But your car doesn't have an intercooler water spray. In fact, the SST doesn't have a water yes, intercooler water yes, spray. That's correct. That's very nice. Thick and nicely, you know, machined. And it hides really well. That's the only drawback of the trunk space. It's a little bit less. But you can still put two overnight bags and go, go for a trip. Yes, that's enough. Mm. Yeah, so if you guys are considering buying an Evo 10, um, think about how much boot space you have. If you need more boot space, then buy an buy a Impreza. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, right? Oh no, buy a Forester. <laughs> Let's have a look at the interior, starting with the rear seats, as always, a four-door car. You have to assess how it is on a daily basis. Of course, it's based on a normal family saloon. So uh, even though it's a high performance car, it does inherit the same things. Sitting back here, ooh, um, I'm 178 centimeters tall, more than enough headroom, knee room for a normal position of the front driver's seat. Seats compared, especially to the CT9A and previous generations of seat, um, I can feel that there's a lot more support uh, for the thighs and the seat back as well. Um, clearly, the Lancer has gone into a higher grade, uh, very close to the Galant of the previous generation. It seems a little bit hard. Uh, the materials on the Lancer version is just plain, you know, sporty black, no accents, no red stitching whatsoever. Um, it's very mundane, very, very normal. Um, as if to focus on the car's performance, but um, it's useful enough compared to the Civic FD2. Civic's still a little bit better, three, but three this is a three-seater. Uh, you have the center armrest, it's cup holders here, and you have the third proper three-point seat belt. That's about it. Now getting into the front seat of the Lancer Evolution 10. Um, you can really tell it's the design is back from 2006 for the base model uh, compared to the previous CT9A. Um, they've gone for a more simple straight table kind of approach but everything's very functional. Uh, on the center here you have a two din which is sitting right on top you can have easy view for the navigation. Of course this is a JDM current rear split screen uh, type where this opens up like this. This is really useful because it puts the screen in a higher position uh, comparable to cars these days. Aircon controls are much more simplified. Uh, you have just three dials, a little bit of space here on the Zenki models and the Koki models. It's actually a, a box, um, gear shift, layout, side brake on the other side, two cup holders. Um, keyless entry. There's a couple of buttons here on the GSR manual version. There's an intercooler water spray button here, but this is not here. AFS here stands for um, automatic front light system. Yeah, where it's the, the light that follows when you turn the steering wheel, right? Uh, here is where uh, it's a big difference from the previous Lancer Evolutions. Um, the bezels on the speedometer and the tachometer and the little screen in the center, uh, the Preface lift models were more simple, kind of like a BMW Alfa Romeo style, one red single color. The uh, Koki models had a more interesting full multi screen color. You can see. Yeah, so this is where if the car actually feels a little bit more, more, more modern, it's still not too bad. Um, interestingly, these SST pedal shifts are made of magnesium. It's really, really interesting. The steering wheel diameter itself um, is still the same diameter from the previous model. So the driving position is more upright. And the best thing about the Evolution 10 are these seats. Actually, about these seats. They are the JDM uh, SR11, which is 
a limited run model for only a couple of years but they used it stock on the evolution 10 compared to the older evo models this probably has the best hold for the thigh support um, it's low but it it's very stiff and the shoulder blade uh, support uh, really locks you in and what's the best thing is that for taller people there is enough uh, room height so these seats really do not need to be changed uh, at all um, other areas where the plastics are you can feel it's a bit outdated really simple um, but the quality of the plastics uh, everything uh, you know it's going to last a long time so you've got a very forward kind of driving position unlike the Civic FD2 the A pillar isn't really in your face it's still kind of like other cars from that era uh, although the actual space between you and the front wheel is a little bit further but um, otherwise the vision is actually pretty good uh, for a car that is designed after 2005 so um, high points to the very usable and very you know convenient user-friendly interior another point to note is this gear shift knob here is an optional uh, JDM dealer item only very nice it has the last evolution etching over here and also uh, over here so it lights up at night when you turn on the the lights I think um, this is also another option thing but actually it looks a little bit tacky because it's just it's just screwed on onto this but well why not it's it a limited feel like we're combined all together no it's not it doesn't feel like it's really part of it and then you have this part as well um, also another interesting note is that the body is a lot bigger the distance from your seat to the outer edge of the car is a lot wider than than previous models but this is quite normal now on, on, on cars these days so you've got to be really careful getting out of the car not to damage the uh, side bolsters of the Recaro seat. So now let us talk about the most important part. <laughs> <laughs> I am an automotive engineer specializing in chassis so I'm going to talk about the most important part of any sports car whether it is a GTR or an NSX or a humble family saloon that can handle and outhandle any supercar. So, what is important in a Lancer Evolution, which is derived from rallying, is everyone will notice is the four wheel drive AYC, ACD, Super AYC, ABS, traction control. Well, all that isn't actually going to help you if the suspension design isn't going to hold in that the tires onto the right geometry as you're going into the corners to allow that four wheel drive system to work. For the Evolution 10, Mitsubishi has redesigned the rear suspension, especially compared to the previous models. Now, the CT9A 789, the 456 actually basically had the same rear suspension, a very complicated double wishbone based multi link suspension. Multi link is a fancy name for a double wishbone base suspension, usually that has more links in order to keep toe control. Now for the Evolution 10, it's been completely redesigned in stiffness, especially for the rear subframe. Uh, the overall function is still the same, but Mitsubishi decided to give it a makeover by uprating the stroke of the rear, which is very important, especially in rallying, uh, which is always a complaint with the Lancer Evolutions and not especially for the Imprezas. Interestingly, on the previous models, the entire rear subframe and the various arms especially the upper arms and the side control arms were made of exotic aluminium in order to reduce weight but they chose to put some of the bars and other rods back into iron or steel for some reason um, leaving only the upper and the lower trailing arm the trailing arm as aluminium but it doesn't really change much in terms of performance now for the front suspension it's still very much the same McPherson struts based suspension but the cross member has been made much flatter in order to increase rigidity um, all important for uh, a front wheel drive front bias heavy car in fact you can see here the front suspension stiffness camber stiffness is increased by seven percent and uh, for the this part here uh, its overall stiffness increased by 23 percent now while the body uh, is increased a lot in stiffness even compared to the previous model the Galant Forte's body is already stiffer than the Lancer Evolution 9 but for the suspension over the heavier body it's also important to increase what's called local stiffness in order to 
keep the car's control as it's going around the corners, especially with high grip tires, uh, which is all important. So using this as a strong base, the four-wheel drive system is then able to do its job carefully. And this is where um, Mitsubishi has always had their really complicated system, which is delved into like electronic dark arts. Now let's have a look at the schematic here of the super all-wheel drive control system. This all-wheel drive control system is actually nothing new. Um, the most mechanical one started by the Galant VR4 and then uh, from the Evolution 4 they introduced AYC which also explained in the Evolution 5 video which you can refer to here about the workings. So what's the difference? You have AYC which is a your control sending torque to the left or the right wheels depending on a multitude of sensors, uh, each wheel sensor, latitude, going this way, that way, and the car points this way, and you turn the steering this way with this much acceleration, it feeds drive to the rear wheels. You've got the HCD system, which is already available from the 7 and the 8 and the 9, in the front, which controls the center differential. Okay, wait, so I need to clear something up. Evos are always 50 50 torque distribution. That never changes front and rear. Um, it's unlike the STI, which can shift drive between the front and rear in certain percentages or other complicated systems. What the system does is to lock the center differential. Okay, it's located here. This is the transfer case with the ACD is a clutch pack system that locks the center diff so that the drive becomes between the front and rear wheels becomes tighter. Therefore controlling the amount of slip going between the rear and the front axles. This helps the car to turn tightly in certain situations. Of course, you don't need this lock to always be on, which is why this SAWC system exists. For the Evolution 10, it's using a newer generation CAN bus system, which is able to communicate independently with each controller around the car, thereby uh, cutting down on complications before it had to go back to a main computer and then go out. So the response of this therefore becomes a lot faster. But the S AWS system also combines engine sensors, uh, its speed, uh, the braking, uh, your control sensor, each individual real sensor, uh, steering sensor, and uh, all this feedback goes into these three different computers, which is integrated with the traction control, which operates the braking force of each individual wheel. So SAVC is different is that it adds rear wheel braking as the car is going around the corner in order to stabilize it. And what's the end result? All this computer compl complicated mathematics and there's even more here as you can see. Um, that's, that's probably enough electronics to rival your iPhone, I'm not sure. But this is what happens. You're steering around the corner in this car and suddenly you start to feel loss of grip in the front tires. So you turn more and magically the car just corrects itself. I'm not even kidding. Um, very much compared to the previous Lancer Evolution 9 which would have this little kind of edgy feel if you lose grip and it takes a little bit of time to get back and it might even swing the other way because usually drivers would try to lift off the throttle but on the Evolution 10 it seems to do everything for you. Um, the wheels would somehow attribute torque uh, appropriately at the right timing and it kind of saves you. Now, if driven carefully, the car does make you feel like you're a better driver. Not that you're a better driver, but the car kind of teaches you how to turn into the car with the right speed possible. Um, it's like a very weird learning curve thing. This is also an opinion shared by many racing drivers and journalists tested back in the day. So compared to the uh, R35 GTR, which sends torque to the front wheels, but it's also a very complicated system, uh, the Evo 10 actually does feel much more stable to drive. And there are three modes, as you can see on the steering wheel, tarmac, gravel, gravel and, snow. and snow. So you must only use those modes on dry roads, on gravel and on snow. <laughs> <laughs> Do not use it for anything else. <laughs> In reality, some tight corners here on Hakone uh, actually works better on the gravel mode because it's a little bit more forgiving. So it's interesting for you to explore this. But on snow, you must only use it on snow. <laughs> Here's a, another diagram of the whole system of the complicated SAWC system. They only show the most important parts, which is the 
center differential. You can't hear it. Oh, okay. Which is the center differential, propeller shaft running across to the back, and the active differential right here. Here's a little bit of mathematics for you who want to figure it out, um, how all this complicated black magic works. Basically, you have control based upon steering angle and the amount of yaw, which is the turning of the car, very much like an airplane. All that's fed back into the computer. And if you press the accelerator more while turning, the car actually turns tighter. This is a way to drive a Lancer Evolution. It's a bit different from cars like the Impreza STI or the GTR. In fact, it's quite difficult to drive compared to that. The STIs would be a bit more forgiving, but on the Evo 10, it's, it's magic. <laughs> it's just magic. Last diagram. This is how it supposedly works. ACD, AYC, ASC, which is aut automatic no, active stability control and ABS. The amount of bars shows how much it works depending on where you are. On a straight line as you're braking, more ACD giving lock to the center differential. AYC works very little bit because it's on the left and right wheels. It doesn't need that much control. As you're braking into a corner, ABS helps you to slow the car down without locking up the brakes. The lock of the center differential decreases and as you turn in, the lock of the center differential then frees up so that it can turn in much sharper. But AYC works to give you more torque to the outside wheel when needed. And as you're inside the corner coming out, uh, pressing on the accelerator, both AYC and ACD locks together to work with a little bit of active stability control, giving the brakes, the rear brakes, a bit of a dab, maintaining the balance of the car. And as you're coming out, full beans to prevent understeer. If it understeers, it gives you more ASC, for example. And if you are going into a spin, a number six, the ASC works full time with a little bit of lock from the ACD. So there's a little display uh, in the center of the instrument cluster which tells you how much the systems work. But if you're going around the corner, you have no time to look at that. So just, just don't bother, okay? Just drive the car. So now we're going to have a proper drive of the Lancer Evolution 10 GSR with the SST six-speed manual transmission. Well, it's a manual without a clutch simply because it's got two clutches in the system that works on the basis of having one standby. So you've got the even gears on one clutch and the odd gears on one clutch. It's always ready to switch gears very quickly. It's much more effective than the older single hydraulic type um, used by cars like the Alpha Seller Speed. Now this system is actually built and supplied by Getrak from Germany, which also supplies the manual transmission, interestingly. Uh, I think it's the same sort of design as the Volkswagen cars, but on the Mitsubishi, uh, it's a little bit different. The hardware is the same, but the, it's, it's all about the programming and just how it's integrated into the engine and the four-wheel drive system. And you've got these pedal shifts on the side, and driving with the pedal shifts, you always have to keep your hands on the six to three, no, sorry, the nine to three position, so you're always within reach of your fingers. And on Julian's Lancer Evolution 10, with the increased boost of the Monster, a boost comes in really quickly. Now the way to drive one of these four-wheel drives uh, is to feel how the front wheels respond when you're making a turn. Now four-wheel drive cars have this really strange tendency to want to understeer, but not this car. The Lancer Evolution 10 works its magic through the SAWC system. You just have to trust it, but not overconfidently. You need to understand how basic vehicle dynamic works in order to make you understand what the car is going to do. But the problem is the whole system uses a wide variety of sensors to sense and predict what the new the driver might do and, and sometimes it actually makes predictions based on your input such as steering angle such as throttle opening and it creates the best possible program to feed into the rear AYC diff which apportionates torque to the left and right wheels 
So for example, turning these high speed corners like that, you fit the steering wheel into the corner. If you keep the throttle constant, it turns constant. When you put it down, the front suddenly grips and you're out of the corner. So it's basically understanding which part of the corner do you need to have the system working for you or against you. For anyone who wants to get into driving these cars, I really recommend you start slowly and to get that feel of how the system works. Uh, it's not a magic system. It doesn't save you. It's not. It's meant to enhance driving rather than a safety device. If you want safety devices, you go buy a Mercedes or a BMW. But this is about sports driving, releasing the full potential of four-wheel drive sports car, using that potential, the power to get through the corners really, really fast. Now, of course, on dry tarmac, you might not necessarily need the power of a four-wheel drive, but what it does give you an advantage is you're able to get out of the corner with more traction and more power earlier than a rear-wheel drive car to keep it stable. This is tremendous because the extra response from this setup um, gives a lot more boost when it's needed at the 4,000, 5,000 RPM range. And at times, when you're holding back on the throttle, you can feel the stability control, keeping the rear all planted and sorted. It does teach you how to be a better driver, or at least it makes you feel like you're a better driver, it makes you feel heroic. So the real question is, is it fun? I guess that's up to you. Yeah, if you like these sort of high-tech vehicles, um, it does maybe detract a little bit from the pure driving feel. If you're that sort of guy, then you're probably better off buying Roadster MX-5 or, or maybe an S2000. No, but this is about enjoying high technology that enables you to corner like a superhero and with more power. Truly, this is the highest point in which Mitsubishi's four-wheel drive technology and their turbocharge system working with all that WRC. You can feel all of Tommy Mackinnon's hard work just put into this car as you're driving it. And if that's something to be savored and enjoyed, um, it's like two ends of the spectrum. You can enjoy high-tech and be really fast and confident. I'll give you another example. This car is so efficient. It's so precise in the way it corners. It's so direct and it does the job for you at exactly and precisely the moment you ask it to with all the technology wrapped in a, a body shell and a design that has an age. It's still cyber looking. It's like a very efficient assassin. You can take this on any mountain road on the circuit and it will do exactly what you want. Bonjour les amis, je m'appelle Julien, je suis le propriétaire de uh, cette Evolution 10. Yes, I'm the owner of this uh, Mitsubishi Evolution 10 and uh, I've been in Japan for 15 years now and uh, me and Captain Bradford actually used to go to Hakone a long time ago and uh, we used to run those roads together and uh, yes, yeah, so about the car. I, I always liked Mitsubishi, like in France, Mitsubishi is uh, very popular and I remember watching taxi uh, movies and uh, I always really wanted to have uh, an evolution and when I moved in Japan, yes, I, I decided to get the 10 because it's modern, reliable, uh, powerful and I really like the shape, the very sleek design and uh, that's why I ended up with, uh, with the car and uh, I hope you enjoy uh, this video and uh, stay tuned for the next adventure with uh, Captain. So guys, we hope you enjoyed this review of the Lancer Evolution 10 and in conclusion, we at JDM Masters feel that you can't get this anymore. Mitsubishi is not going to make another car like this. In fact, there's no other next model even for the base model. Um, if you want the very best of 
Mitsubishi's four-wheel drive engineering and a very tunable engine with looks that are still kind of up to date and it's still a very good rival for the uh, Impreza STI or even the Civic Type R. It carries four people, five people maybe if you squeeze a baby seat, um, enough room in the trunk and it's available everywhere. You don't have to come to Japan and buy, purposely buy a JDM model. Uh, this could be a good performance car. You should consider getting one before prices really go up for plus classic evolutions. So thanks for joining and let us know in the comments uh, what other cars you'd like us to review. That's all from us. Peace out.